I want to run a what if scenario with you. So you head to work, get to the office, you go upstairs to your desk and you start working. And as you're filing the reports, you get an email from one of your coworkers. I wonder what it is. And it's a thank you note. They're saying that they're leaving the company, they're happy with everyone, want to keep in contact, yada, yada, yada. You're thinking, what's going on? So during your lunch break, you rush over to their desk and you're like, listen, are you switching careers? Got a better job offer? What's, what's going on? What's happening? And they tell you, actually, I'm quitting my job because I'm retiring. Funny thing is, they aren't 50 or 60. They're your age. Well, if you could be honest, they're younger than you. How would you react? Sounds crazy, right? But today, we're going to talk with a couple that did just that. We'll find out how they quit their jobs to pursue financial freedom. Welcome to the Couple Money Podcast, a show where we help spouses get on the same page, dump their debt faster, and get on the path to financial freedom. I'm El Martinez. Support for this podcast comes from 5 Days to 5K Course. It's a free week-long series that's designed to show you how to find, save, and make more money that's broken down into manageable chunks. If you're busy and only have 20 minutes here or there, this course is for you. Sign up at couplemoney.com slash 5K. September is here, which means this week we're nailing down what we'd like to do before the year closes out. And we have two big goals for our family. The first one is finishing up our basement. And the second is taking a family vacation. And we want to do both debt-free. As you probably know, when you're doing any kind of remodeling around the house, you're talking about big bucks. So we've been extra focused this year on keeping an eye on our budget. And with the vacation, we're looking for creative and frugal ways to have a fantastic time without breaking the bank. But how about you? What goal or two do you guys want to knock out these next few months? There's still time to do something big. Even though money is not the most important thing, it's kind of funny how much these numbers affect us. For example, that job situation. How would you feel if you had a coworker retire early or even take a break, a sabbatical for a year or two? What would go through your mind? Maybe you'd be like, you know what? That sounds fantastic. I wish I could do that, but I can't. More often than not, one of the things holding you back are the finances. You're worried about how could we afford it? Uh, We need to have a cushion to take care of expenses. Could I find a job again? There's so much going on and you're not alone. According to data from the Federal Reserve's Survey of Consumer Finances, of those households that have a savings account, the median balance in the United States is 5,200. That's not enough to cover a basic three-month emergency fund for most families. When money is tight, it stresses you out and also keeps you from doing the things you really want to do. And I, I get it, you know, we like to have a safety net, especially when you have kids. But you can achieve those big dreams, take that leap, and not ruin your finances. It takes, though, a plan and a process. And that's why today, Allie and Matt are on the podcast to break down how they're pursuing financial freedom on the road after quitting their jobs. Now, whether you want to pivot your career, travel more, or just want some more options in your life, there's some wonderful strategies and tactics you can use. So in this episode, we're going to get into why they pursued financial independence and what that means to them. The steps that they took to save 70% of their income and then why they shifted and quit their jobs earlier than expected, even though they did not reach their FI number. Let's see if we can get you guys one step closer to your big goals. 
Hope you enjoy. Thanks for, you know, taking time. Where, where are you now? Is it Michigan still? Or I think I saw on Instagram. Yep. yep. We're on the Western coast of Michigan right now. Have done something I think a lot of couples have dreamed about. Like they're in the job. They're not happy with it. But the reality is they have all these bills they want to pay, uh, obligations, debts. But you guys have quit your jobs. Um, whoa. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's big. And you guys were doing really well. So what, first of all, I, I'm kind of curious, like, how did you guys – break that to your manager's supervisor. I think my supervisor was a little more concerned than Matt's probably. My mine was um concerned that I was like going to ruin my career and I was kind of like, well, I mean, I don't want to be in this career, so <laughs> that's okay. Um and I think there's a lot of fear again just mm-hmm. like coming out and you know they have only known that path. Like that has been their path is like the conventional nine to five for 40 years. And so seeing someone else do something different is scary and they don't have a model for how that is going to come, come out. And so it's, it is from coming from a place of love too, because they want to see, you know, us succeed. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's, it's unknown and there is uncertainty. I mean, Mm -hmm. but there's uncertainty with, staying in a nine to five too, that you could, you know, classify. So nice job. Yeah. Yeah. Mine was, I was really nervous to tell my boss actually. So like I had a lot of nervousness and kind of jitters. So I was really struggling to like find the right way, the mm-hmm. right time to tell my employer that I was going to quit. Um, partially just cause like, you know, I respected him, but I was also afraid of lashback from him. Like, you know, just the questions and yeah. him being like disapproving, which I know is kind of weird, but I felt that way. So I actually told him in my performance review. So we had talked about my last year's performance and then we got to the end of the meeting and he kind of asked me like, you know, how I was doing and what I was thinking about. And I was like, well, I'm actually thinking about taking some time off. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, but yeah, after I told him he was, you know, very supportive. He was like, you know, once you get kind of that idea in your, your mind, like you have to follow through with it. Cause if you didn't follow through with it, you'd regret it later and be like, yeah. What if I had? So yeah. I think he totally understood, and uh, the fears, my fears, were unjustified. But. Okay. Yeah, and usually, I mean, most times, I will say, the, the fears that you have are they don't ever materialize. I mean, there's of course like certain circumstances. For, for the most part, like you're like, oh my goodness, this is going to be horrible. Everything's going to break down. Very rarely is it like that worst case scenario that you keep replaying in your mind. But you guys created this huge goal. And I'm kind of curious, like, where were the seeds planted, those first discussions? I think it was you, Ali, had told him about Mr. Money Mustache. So was that on your mind for a while? How did that go? Yeah, so we initially had a plan uh, to reach FI and, like, (laughs) conventionally retire, I guess. Conventional isn't the right word. FI? <laughs> yeah, conventional <laughs> FI is like working nine to fives and retire in 10 years. And we kind of got to this place where after four years of being in Bakersfield, we like woke up and we were like, you know, we're not happy living here. We're not happy with our jobs here. Like, why are we sticking this out just to reach this magical number when we have the confidence in ourselves to be able to continue generating income while in retirement. And so it was kind of an evaluation of risk and determining that for our mental and physical health and our well-being, that it would be best to take the jump now, even though financially it's not, a lot of people would say it was not the right decision, decision because we did walk away from really high paying jobs with no income coming in already really. And we, ha- but we had these, these goals and these ideas of how we would generate income, but n- it wasn't coming in yet. Um, so I think we, yeah, in that sense, we had to prioritize our mental and physical health over mm-hmm. um, financial. Yeah. I mean, there's a, yeah. there's a lot that you're saying. So I kind of like want to pick apart some of it. Yeah. But, uh, for one, like you were talking about like mental health and mm-hmm. physical health, um, how were you guys being affected um, staying with the nine to five? Did you guys notice or pick up on with each other? Definitely. I was working really long hours. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I was working like 10 hour days. Plus I had an hour commute each way. So oh, I'm waking up yeah. at like four in the morning, you know, leaving the house at five. I don't get back home till like 5 p.m. Mm-hmm. We see each other for a little while. 
cook some dinner, go yeah. to sleep. Plus at that point we had started trying to start these businesses kind of on the side. So it was really just taking a huge toll on the amount of time that we were getting to connect with each other, mm-hmm. real like quality time. So we started to definitely feel the drag of that. Yeah. My job while I was there, I was mm-hmm. enjoying it for the most part. Mm-hmm. Um, but right before we left, I'd gotten transferred to a different position. So mm-hmm. just the work type that I was doing had changed and it wasn't quite as enjoyable. So that was mm-hmm. another kind of impetus for us to make the jump. Allie, yeah. I know, is less satisfied at her nine to five. I just felt like I picked the wrong career, like completely. And it wasn't anything to do with the job at all. Like my coworkers were amazing. My boss was great. And I was in a supportive environment. I just felt like I was not using my strengths and I was not using like my skills at all. And I felt really dissatisfied in that. And I felt like I wasn't living up to my potential, even though society externally, I was doing amazing. Um, I just, I couldn't be happy with that. And then, you know, that's like a curse in some cases, because it's like, you think of how many people would kill to be in my position and yeah. want my problems, you know? Did you feel kind of guilty in a sense? Not like, yeah, like you did mm-hmm. something bad, but like, I am in a great position because you guys had between the two of you, what was it like 250000 a year you were making? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We were both had six figure incomes. Yeah. So... Mm-hmm. Yeah, compared to a lot of people who would be leaving into FI, the opportunity cost is huge because you're leaving behind like a very large salary. Yeah. yeah. But really, it's it's difficult to put a price on your your mental and physical well being because mm-hmm. yeah, like all of this stress was just causing anxiety and depression to kind of boil up, like just general unwellness and dissatisfaction. Yeah. And so I kind of want to discuss this for yeah. you. What does financial independence mean? So for me, financial independence is like doing what we're doing now is like having the financial freedom to create the life that you want to do work that makes you feel alive and brings purpose and joy to your life. Now to Matt. We got asked this question, like if we consider ourselves retired prior and that's where kind of our differences came up because I feel like we've retired out of the nine to five jobs, Yeah, but we're replacing that with something that we're more passionate about but I still have to work in that to make money. So there's another level where there's still just like this, I don't know, safety blanket where it's mm-hmm. like, okay, I don't have to do this. I'm doing this just because I want to do this. And I think the things that we're working on with our businesses, mm-hmm. you know, people who are doing the conventional route of if I need something like that anyway, because you're going to retire at in your thirties or your forties and you can't just catch potato and golf for like 40 years. We just took those things that we think, okay, what are we going to want to do when we don't have to work for money? And let's turn those into businesses that make money anyway. Because if we're providing value to people, mm-hmm. you know, some money is going to flow in. And we mm-hmm. don't need a lot to survive. Our cost of living is super low. So we knew we'd be okay without, with making the jump a little earlier before we had that, you know, for sure, safety blanket, this money and in our index funds will carry us through for the rest of our lives. Yeah. Gotcha. So you've guys done this for years, like really nailed living on less than what you earn. And I believe I read it was 70% of your income. You guys had it down to that. That required like prioritizing and making some decisions. So can you kind of take me on this process? How did you whittle it down or how did you keep lifestyle inflation from, you know, taking over and ruining your finances? Mm -hmm. I think the biggest thing we did was house hacking. We bought a house and rented all the rooms out. And so our mortgage was essentially zero. So the, you know, housing is normally the biggest expense for people. Mm -hmm. And for us that we didn't have that expense. And so that helped a lot. We also did some travel hacking whenever we we traveled, um, which I don't recommend to everyone. um, But where we were at, it worked well. And could you explain like, you explain house hacking, travel hacking for those that are kind of new and not familiar mm-hmm. with the concept. Yeah. So like I said, we tried to go after like our top categories. So yeah. housing super expensive. When we first got together, I was renting a room in a house. She was running an apartment. So we were paying, you know, $2,000 a month mm. to live somewhere. Yeah. So this didn't happen right away. This is probably two years in. Um, we bought a house and then we bought a large four bedroom house. We lived in the master and we rented the other three rooms out. And we looked for a while for a house that would kind of 
the numbers would pencil out where mm-hmm. the rent we would get from the other rooms would cover the mortgage. Yeah. We had hoped to find something where it covers even more. So you get money, you get paid money to live there. Um, <laughs> But that was tough in our area. So everybody's city's different. You know, yeah. where you're willing to live is different. Yeah. So, but house hawking was definitely a huge swing. You know, say twenty five thousand dollars a year that we wow. were spending on rent or a mortgage would have been mm-hmm. spending, and now that's basically covered. And then we were gaining equity every month too. So five hundred bucks a month in equity that yeah, is yeah. positive. So so there's that that kind of gets accounted into your net worth that's building yeah. that you're not actually having to spend out of your Income. Nice. Mm-hmm. nice. So that was a really big lever that we pulled. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Other things were like cars. I had like a 2013 um, car that I sold and bought a 2008 Prius for cheap. Mm-hmm. I had a huge commute. So just optimizing things like that to reduce your cost for gas and cars, mm-hmm. to reduce your cost for groceries and eating out, um, mainly eating out. Yeah, we, eating out, we, we cut down significantly. Cut yeah, um, I we I was right out of college. I had pretty mm-hmm. high bar tabs. Yeah, going out with friends <laughs> that got cut. Um, so yeah, just like there was a lot of low hanging fruit that we were able to knock out right away. But mm-hmm. it definitely was a process. It didn't happen overnight. Like I said, buying the house and kind of setting our life up in a way that we could drive those expenses down was a thing that was constantly being improved on over that entire four years. Mm -hmm. What was this process for you? Do you guys like do weekly check-ins when, when you were in the middle of that four year period where you were talking about money or is it like monthly or more formal or casual? How did you guys do it? We had monthly money meetings where Mm -hmm. we would pull all of our expenses and Mm -hmm. Matt would categorize them. And then we'd compare like how we did this month versus last month. We'd talk about what went well this month, what we'd like to do better next month. And those meetings really opened up lines of communication. So when we're not in that formal meeting setting, we can still have the conversation of, Mm -hmm. should we buy this or should we buy that? We also, from pretty close to the beginning of our relationship, made a rule where we would ask each other before we spent more than $10. 20 bucks, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I would... Pretty much <laughs> asked each other before we made any any purchases. Anything outside of like groceries and gas. And yeah, stuff, yeah, yeah. But that helped to kind of keep mm-hmm. accountable because I struggled be- in the beginning with like wanting to shop online and like mm-hmm. yeah. buy things. Amazon was, you know, amazing. It is amazing. But <laughs> <laughs> I would find myself like putting things in my car when I was bored at work and then thinking like okay now I have to ask Matt and like I'm sure he would he always says says yes like if I ask mm-hmm. him you know and if it's something that we will use and need but just like the fact that I had to ask him made me think like do I really need this you know or yeah. can I can I insource this can I make this myself can I you know do something more creative or the fact that we had to like talk about it made me think twice before I yeah. purchase something it's just those little little things that maybe we take for granted yeah. um, can at least put a pause on this, the spending. But Mm -hmm. I know like, it's not, you don't want to feel like you're being deprived, but I know a lot of people who live a frugal and um, FI lifestyle, they find that their hobbies are replaced and and they find other things to explore. Have you guys noticed that you don't eat out as much? So what do you guys do to kind of have fun with your friends? So that Mm -hmm. was definitely a struggle whenever Mm -hmm. we, moved into like going into down FI path was all of our friends were in the same industry as us and they Mm -hmm. all had similar incomes. And so kind of the thing to do was like go out to the bars and go drinking and go out to eat. But when we stopped doing that, we started inviting more people over to, so we could have like a home cooked meal at our house or doing um, like hikes together and organizing that or do organizing like camping trips, which were pretty low cost. We could like drive there and all carpool. And so just getting creative about, you know, and those things are typically more fun. Like I Mm -hmm. think going camping or, you know, cooking a meal at your house is much more intimate than like going to a bar and buying $15 drinks and, you Mm -hmm. know, expensive things, expensive food that isn't very good oftentimes when oftentimes we can cook better food at home. We find ways to kind of either replace or substitute, (laughs) you know, or make it less expensive. Yeah. Guys, look like you like line by line you you know did this as a process very thoughtful i got one last question because i know a lot of people are going to be listening or seeing this interview and they're thinking 
I would love to be able to do that. That you know, there might be even your coworkers. <laughs> they're like, yeah, remember, <laughs> they retired early. You know, in the back of their minds, they're like, I would love to do that. What advice or tip would you give them for that first step, like either a conversation or something to do? It's really around prioritization. Yeah. So that was definitely in the conversations we started mm-hmm. having when we were first got turned on to Mr. Money Mustache and this FI route, and it's like, okay what do we want our lives to look like and what are we willing to give up now to get that even sooner? Yeah. So I think that was kind of the decision we made and why we were able to accelerate it and be so diligent about our finances and cutting expenses. Was we had we, that vision. Yeah. We had that vision for what we wanted yeah. and we made that a priority because you know, you only have so much room in your life, you only have so much money in your life and you can spend it in different ways. So mm-hmm. you can have a lot of stuff or you can really like laser focus that on getting one thing or a couple things Mm -hmm. and really accelerate the timeline for that. So I think it's really having that discussion, especially, you know, if you're married with your partner, Mm -hmm. uh, what that vision for your life looks like. And then you guys just have to make a plan from there and and then it's just executing. But that that vision is what's going to keep you dedicated to doing the right things and the things that you need to do because it's a pretty long road. Like uh, the conventional path that FI is yeah. at least 10 years, you know, in a lot mm-hmm. of cases, it can be longer than that and be 20 or more. So you really have to have kind of a guiding light, light if yeah, you're going yeah. to stay consistent for mm-hmm. that long of time. Yeah. Special thanks to Matt and Allie for sharing their story. There's a lot going on, and I'd love to discuss this more. And if you haven't already, please make sure you follow their journey at owenyourfuture.com. They have some fantastic van life photos over at Instagram, too, if you want to follow that. Now, before we close up, I want to focus on some key takeaways that I got from them. You know, very rarely does a situation fit you exactly when you listen to a show. But still, there's always some kind of takeaway or some kind of action that you can get some inspiration. And this is what I jotted down with them. I had three. The first one was define your dream. These two did a great job. They looked at what they really wanted and determined for them, they didn't want to stay in one spot. For them, moving around, traveling, exploring was a part of their life plan. They want to have kids down the line, but they want to do at least this part of their travel right now. So they clearly define that. That's something that we can all take away. What do you want to do by the end of this year or even next year or beyond? Don't just say, oh, we'll save for retirement or kids college or buy a house. What does the house look like? What kind of trip do you guys want to take? What does retirement mean to you? Defining those things really can make a huge difference between um, sort of working that direction till going full throttle on your goal. And second is the money has to come from somewhere. So be willing to challenge every expense. Now, you might not want a house hack like Allie and Matt did. I understand that everyone's situation is different, but did you see they looked at all of their expenses and really nailed down, if this is what we want, how does this expense fit in? Now, there's going to be some expenses that you can't eliminate right away or ever. They're just going to be with you. We need to eat, right? Have some kind of shelter and also take care of clothes on our backs. But what other expenses can you evaluate? Can you trim back? Can you find another creative outlet? You may surprise yourself with the answers that you come up with. And then finally, it's always helpful to have some kind of extra income stream. It does not have to be like they are building an income stream they completely rely on. But for you guys, do you have something you can do on the side, part-time, maybe together split that up? where you're making some extra money so you can put that towards your goals. Maybe you're saving for a house. Having a bigger down payment can be a huge help. Or maybe you're trying to pay off debt. Having some kind of income stream that's separate from your main job can be not only a financial help, but maybe give you a creative outlet or way to pivot your career down the line. So those were my takeaways. I'd love to hear from you, and I want to continue this discussion. And if you want to as well, 
please join our free private Facebook community over at Thriving Families. It's fun. We talk about practical ways that we're moving closer towards our goals. You can join us at couplemoney.com slash FB. Thank you so much for listening. As always, I'll have everything in the show notes, how you connect with the Owens, resources we mentioned, and the full interview we have. It's up on YouTube, but I'll have a link to it in the show notes. I want you guys to go from saying, we have this big dream to actually taking the next steps. And before I forget, I have a cool announcement. If the two of you are looking for a crazy fun date night idea, and you live in either Orlando, Detroit, or Kansas City, listen up. My buddy Joe from Stacking Benjamins is going on a tour. Yep, a podcast is going on a tour. It's nothing like you've ever seen. If you listen to a show, you know it's always a blast. He has some special guest stars and not just in the financial field. So if you want to get more information and grab a ticket, go to stackingbenjamins.com slash tour. Yep, it's in the show notes as well. But if you're busy and you'd rather have me send the show notes to you, go ahead and join our community. It's free, it's fun, and you get some exclusive stuff. It's over at couplemoney.com slash join. Our theme song was written and produced by Gentle Regime. Additional music by Lee Rosefear. Finally, I hope you have a fantastic week. If there's anything I can do to help you out, please reach out to me. I hope you have a great day. Take care.